Everyone who's traveled to or lived in Southern California has seen his work. The famous Space Age theme building at Los Angeles International Airport is a signature design and one of many landmarks that define the local landscape. Viewers of movies and popular television programs like Dynasty and Murder, She Wrote have seen this majestic mansion he designed covering 12,000 square feet and 16 rooms. Created to remind the owner of the castle he saw in his boyhood home in England, this Pasadena house built for self-made millionaire and thoroughbred horse breeder Jack Atkin was developed on a stately lot of three and a half acres. Major renovations to the Beverly Hills Hotel, including a new color scheme and a glamorous makeover of the Polo Lounge, exhibited the grand sense of style and elegance the architect wanted to convey. In all, he was responsible for designing more than 3,000 structures. These projects included homes for movie stars like Lon Chaney, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, and Frank Sinatra. Homes were designed for prominent people in the business world, including Jay Paley of the CBS television network and automobile magnet E.L. Cord. Hotels he designed housed the rich and famous. Banks, business buildings, and high fashion stores like Saks Fifth Avenue and Beverly Hills also carried his unique combination of style and functionality. Government structures he designed included courthouses, schools, office buildings, and affordable housing projects. Through it all, he never forgot the common man or the struggles of those born without privilege. He was Paul Revere Williams, a legend in architecture. But to his granddaughter, Karen Hudson, he was just a very kind grandpa. Karen lives in the house her grandfather designed for himself and Karen's grandmother. He was an orphan, and as an orphan, family is more important to him than anything else. My grandmother was his rock. I don't think he would have been nearly successful without her support. And he called my mother and my aunt his babies to his dying day. He never brought his work home, except for during the war when he had an office at the house. So they were never privy to the unpleasantness and the racism that he had to suffer. And at the same time, they were not interested in the fame. So he never brought that part of it home. As a child, I learned about who he was basically in school. I knew he was an architect, I knew he designed things, but he, w he never let us think he was anything other than our grandpa. Paul Revere Williams was the first African American to join the American Institute of Architects. Born in 1894 and orphaned at the age of four, he made his way through life because of extraordinary talent, artistic flair, charm, hard work, and fierce determination. He had faith in God and a foster mother who pushed him toward success and encouraged his dreams. Well, I think he loved art from the time he was a child. In elementary school, he, he drew everything, and the teachers from those early days told him he would never succeed, mostly because the majority population, the Caucasians, were not going to hire him, and the African Americans and any other minority could not afford him so that he would not be able to make a living at it. What people did at the time was they would encourage talented black children to become doctors or lawyers because they'd say, your people always are going to need those. But everyone talked in terms of you could only make a living from your own community. People often ask me, how was he able to do all this? The simple answer, it had to be a God-given talent. He was singular. There were, uh, there were almost no um, um, African-American architects, and no one no one ever has had the, the success that he had. Um, um, he was the, the most successful um, African-American architect who, um, of the 20th century, and we'll see about the 21st, but uh, his record may hold up. Um, but um, this is what African-American um, architectural historians um, have told me. Um, there was him up here and then a very few in, on, the, on the next uh, level. After attending the local Beaux-Arts Institute of Design in Los Angeles and the architectural engineering program at the University of Southern California, Paul Revere Williams began his career working for then-established Los Angeles architects. He used this experience to refine his skills. 
His talent was clearly demonstrated when he won an architectural design contest and $200 in prize money in 1914. Five years later, in 1919, he won another design contest. He was confronted with racism in his career, but managed to overcome it by using charm and grace, and by working harder than everyone else. In those days, wealthy whites had few contacts with black professionals. He learned how to draw and sketch upside down, so that he would not make clients uncomfortable by sitting next to them. Paul Revere Williams persevered and his talent was too vast to be ignored. His belief in being a self-made man and earning everything through determination and vigorous labor led to his involvement in the moderate wing of the Republican Party, as seen here with Nelson Rockefeller in the 1960s. Williams was a living variation of the Horatio Alger myth, with the added accomplishment of overcoming many racist barriers in society. Without a doubt, he was a Republican, which served him well in the work that he got in presidential commissions. And it, historically, black folks were all Republicans at one point. And because he had to do so many things, you know, times have not changed that much. Black people still have to work harder for the same job. They still have to, to be accepted in the same kind of way. You cannot do a job that you think is just okay. If you want to succeed, if you want to be recognized for your accomplishments, you have to work harder, you have to be better, and you have to not talk about it. You just have to do it. You have to do your work. And for him, I think those are lessons that stuck with him. He figured if he could do this, you know, he'd bought into the American dream, he was by himself, so that anybody can do it. And maybe he was a little rigid about that. I think he didn't like the idea of, you know, at, at one point, people started thinking, okay, government assistance is gonna help and this is gonna help. I think for him it was, we'll all be better off if we help ourselves. Determination, sheer determination to not listen to people putting you in a box and telling you what you can or cannot do, to follow your heart to know who you are and to know what you want to do, what your purpose is, and to pursue that purpose and to pursue that goal with all of your heart. Two, for me, is to have a set of principles to guide your life. He had a set of principles that he had in his life that he used to, to navigate through his life, through the obstacles. We may or may not agree with his principles, but he used those principles and he was very successful based upon those principles. And number three is class. He had class, he just had class. And I think that when you, when you, I think that that's a natural thing that just came to him naturally. But you have to understand the, the need to be able to communicate to a diverse audience and to be able to communicate with ease and not get people uneasy, if you will. By the early 1940s, Paul Revere Williams' long career was well established and his sterling reputation had become renowned. At that time, there was a need to build government financed facilities to support America's involvement in World War II. Allied Engineers Incorporated, a firm organized by Paul Revere Williams, received a commission to design and construct the Long Beach Navy Base. Williams and fellow architect Adrian Wilson were the primary designers of the Long Beach Naval Station. The war in the Pacific required the construction of a new base in Long Beach that would serve naval personnel with training and provide them with conditioning facilities and recreational opportunities. Features of the Roosevelt Base included an administration building, a large swimming pool, and a gymnasium, seen here in 1996. The base included an officer's club many thought was comfortable and comparable to other men's clubs of the day. The Navy had a profound impact on Long Beach in the 1940s. Men from all over the country made contact with the Naval Station. Many from the colder regions of the Midwest fell in love with the Mediterranean climate and the seemingly boundless freedom, sunshine, jobs and opportunities offered in Long Beach at the end of the war. Many sailors found brides among the local population or brought their sweethearts to Long Beach from their Midwestern hometowns. 
They settled down to family life in the post-World War II GI Bill tract home environment that defined much of East Long Beach at the time. And also soon after, it defined the neighboring incorporated city of Lakewood. This influx of Midwestern transplants led to Long Beach becoming known as Iowa by the Sea. Iowa Day picnics were held annually at a Long Beach park throughout the 1950s and 60s, drawing thousands, including, on occasion, the governor of Iowa. Because of his own strong devotion to family life, Paul Revere Williams empathized with the desire of young veterans to settle down and raise families in new homes. He authored two architectural pattern books for war veterans and others of modest means. Resources provided in the pattern books included detailed floor plan sketches and suggestions on how to build affordable homes that were both functional and attractive. He would not want to be remembered as architect of the stars. I think it was just as important to him to design public housing, affordable housing as it was, to design homes and places where he could not live. The construction of the Naval Station, and by default, the resulting population boom in Long Beach after the war were not the only contributions Paul Revere Williams made to the city and its landscape. The Naval Station is gone today, closed during base realignment in the 1990s and demolished to make way for valuable seaport terminal space. In downtown Long Beach, a bank building designed by Williams at 4th Street and Pine Avenue is still standing. Today, the structure has been converted to a nightclub. The upscale neighborhoods of the Virginia Country Club and Park Estates also include homes designed by Paul Revere Williams. In the Virginia Country Club neighborhood, the most prominent business leaders, doctors, and lawyers built houses right next to the golf course. Jim Wood was one of those businessmen. He co-owned the Wood Callahan Oil Company with Lester Callahan. Wood hired Williams to design his new home in 1941. In the early 40s, it was considered a status symbol to have Paul Revere Williams design your dream house. Williams was already known as the architect for the movie stars. Nancy Wood, daughter of Jim Wood, lived in the house until 1948 when she went away to college. Nancy and her new husband, Francis Herzog, held their wedding reception in the Wood House in 1950. The reception was a premier social event in Long Beach. The city's upper crust turned out in droves. People dressed in furs and fine suits lined up on the sidewalk, all the way out to the street, to participate in the reception. In all, there were about 300 invited guests who joined in the merriment. I guess in the front hall we greeted everyone in, in the reception line. So we went to my parents' room, there was a balcony outside their door. We threw the bouquet and uh, the photographer hadn't managed to rush up in time to, <laughs> to take the picture, so we had to throw it over again. <laughs> and. Uh, then we just got changed into our going away suits and ran down the stairs. Nancy's mother, Helen Wood, lived in the house until she passed away in the late 1990s. The house was in its original condition, including some renovations done in 1949. When the current owners, Randy and Brenda Turnbow, bought the house, they had to make necessary repairs and complete a few alterations to accommodate a more contemporary lifestyle. However, the Turnbows remained faithful to the original spirit and the authenticity of the core design. Uh, at first, when we first looked at the house, we didn't realize it was Paul Williams' house, but it was quickly brought to our attention that we had, uh, in essence, a uh, not only a very fine home, but what was becoming a historical home. Uh, just because of uh, Paul Williams' design. So we loved what he had done. We had been to other Paul Williams houses up in L.A. when they had been on some kind of tour. Uh, we read all about him, and we wanted to keep that feeling that he had originally designed. Uh, he was famous for designing uh, large homes, uh, very nice homes, but very comfortable homes. And that's just how we wanted to live. And uh, so this room we're sitting in, for instance, is a very large 
a front room that can accommodate our whole big family and all our children and grandchildren at Christmas and yet still feel very homey and comfortable and uh, not austere. I think Randy's alluded to uh, you have dreams when you're young and uh, one of my dreams as a little girl was to live in a historic colonial house but I thought that will never happen because they're just back east and uh, this is our third house in the neighborhood. We've lived in two other beautiful homes, a Dutch colonial and a Williamsburg colonial. But um, this house just kind of called to us. It met both of our needs. We did have a desire to be on the golf course and have those views. Um, the thing about this house, when I first walked in, I saw this ingle nook, this uh, fireplace, and it had such a warmth, and I thought, I can live here. This is not a stuffy house. This is a warm house. A thing about Paul Williams, as I'm learning more about him, he was a man that was about family, about warmth, love, and his strong faith. And these are all things that Randy and I have been about in our 41 years of marriage. The originally separated rumpus room was connected to the main house. It's now the Super Bowl room and the Monday night football room for the Turnbows. The old blueprints of the house still exist. Paul R. Williams' name appears prominently on the bottom. And this house, for instance, uh, is not the typical box setting on top of a box, which is the basic plan and format of a colonial-style house. This one, the, the, it has a long front porch, and that's square, but from both sides, the two wings, which one is the front room and one is the dining room, are set at 45-degree angles creating all these interesting views of the street, the backyards, various gardens, and, uh, and it provides a unique and interesting uh, flair and a lot of curb appeal when you drive up. It's again a sense of proportion that you have a large house, but you have the spaces broken down into a more intimate scale where you don't feel overwhelmed when you walk into the space. You don't feel intimidated. You feel drawn into the space. He, he had a, a very good sense of, of proportion, of, of height versus width, of how to move through a space, how a progression of spaces work. And that, that, that works very well that the building, the home doesn't just look like a large home or a mansion. When you enter the home, it feels like a home. And that's something that you have to learn and it's acquired and you're, you're able to repeat that throughout your, your work as, as your body of work develops. And he definitely was very successful in developing that style from the very beginning and building upon it. Another upscale neighborhood in Long Beach features a significant structure designed by Paul Revere Williams. This Park Estates home was constructed by Lloyd Whaley. Whaley was a well-known builder in Long Beach, responsible for developing large areas of the city. His home was the first in the Park Estates area. These photos were taken by his son, Lloyd Dale Whaley, in 1949 and 1950, shortly after the home was completed. This home bears characteristic Williams touches. The swirling curved staircase and the comfortable casual living space are familiar attributes of the Williams repertoire. The development of the Whaley Estate began a boom in the Park Estates area. The home was constructed for a cost of $50,000, a significant sum in 1949. An electrical fire 10 years later in 1959 caused extensive damage. Much of the second floor had to be reconstructed. Using the original Paul Revere Williams plans, the home was rebuilt to resemble the original structure at a cost of $80,000. The home was sold in 1970 to Dan Ritter of the Knight Ritter newspaper chain. The sale price in 1970, $290,000. The home was sold again in 1997 for around $2.3 million. The new owners are Mitch and Alice Rouse. The home has been renovated to reflect their decorative tastes and lifestyle, but many of the core elements of the design remain. After the Whaley House was constructed, Park Estates became known as Hill Hill because numerous young medical doctors bought lots, built houses, and moved into the neighborhood. Lots were selling for two to $7,000, according to longtime Long Beach real estate agent Ruby Bothwell. 
this was called Pill Hill because there were some most the young doctors who at that time said, well, when we make 25000 a year, we'll be set, you know. <laughs> and, they, and, and so we had all these doctors who developed a memorial hospital. It's been a wonderful place to live in it. It still is, and, and it's changed a lot. You don't know every single neighbor like we used to know everybody. Everybody knew everybody. And now it's more, you know, people move their own lives along, and that's the way it is. You just, it isn't like it used to be, but it's a wonderful place to be. In Long Beach, as in many other communities in Southern California, Paul Revere Williams left an indelible mark. His inspirations continue to serve as models for many architects and builders from the 1950s until today. To me, his buildings are not only notable for the details or for his sense of materials or for the decoration or for, as his people have talked about, stairs or curves, but uh, equally important are things that don't get comment commented on, like the general circulation patterns as they go through, his integration of indoor and outdoor space, the siting of the buildings is very important, massing of the buildings. But they all come back to that same innate uh, sense of style and sense of proportion. That, I think, is innate. If you don't work at it, though, if you don't force yourself to look at things, and of course it's a pleasure if you enjoy looking at things. And I think you can tell when you look at his work that he took a real, had a real sense of pleasure about doing the work. Paul Revere Williams' life story is one that compels many to trace his background, celebrate his success, and acknowledge his contributions to architecture and society in general. I guess if you start from being a person of quality and a person who believes in what they're doing, it's possible. Just that we don't know how to generate that in ourselves at times. He had to be a very positive individual. And coming up when he came up, uh, I didn't even know how he did it. I have no idea. I think that Paul Williams was a one in a million man, especially a one in a million black man at that time in history. He had extreme talent. He had the look. He had the focus and determination. And he had at that time the political correctness of his time to be able to go through open doors that would be open. And it was from his heart. It wasn't a contrived political correctness. It was from his heart. And I think that rare combination made him a one in a million black man who was able to achieve greatness. As time marches on, some structures designed by Paul Revere Williams inevitably will be torn down. Others will survive and continue to be recognized as functioning works of art. Uses of buildings may change over time. Owners will come and go, and renovations will occur to accommodate for modern necessities and changing lifestyles. But the body of Paul Revere Williams' work will be remembered, and his spirit will live on for those who experience his masterpieces in person and research his many other creations. Paul Revere Williams, truly a legend in architecture.